As preparations for Starship's 10th flight continue, SpaceX has confirmed the Super Heavy booster will not be caught this time. So, so why skip the catch attempt? Meanwhile, Firefly Aerospace has landed another key NASA contract, building on its recent lunar success and expanding its role in moon missions. In a bold move, NASA has also announced plans to build a nuclear reactor on the moon, a major step toward powering future missions and permanent bases. Let's break it all down in today's episode of Great SpaceX. Flight 10 of SpaceX's Starship program is likely just a couple of weeks away, and preparations are accelerating on all fronts. The latest developments at the launch site have introduced some unexpected twists, including the reinstallation of a key system at Pad 1. This system had previously been dismantled following a successful round of tests with S-37, but is now back in place. The surprise return of this hardware strongly suggests that SpaceX intends to test S-37 again. The test stand has already been transported back to the launch pad and lifted into position atop the orbital launch mount. Meanwhile, over at the production site, there have been there has been notable change involving the Raptor vacuum engines. One of the vacuum-optimized Raptors appears to have encountered a problem during the previous round of testing, prompting SpaceX to swap it out. This kind of issue detection during the ground test phase is actually a positive development. It allows engineers to address problems early, preventing more serious complications during flight. This is especially important now, given that Starship has faced issues in three separate launches so far this year. As a result, the ship segment will receive close scrutiny in the lead-up to Flight 10. As of now, no official schedule has been announced for S-37's next movement or test. However, it's unlikely to take long to reinstall the test rig and secure the newly installed engine. With that in mind, another round of static fire testing could take place later this week. Based on community feedback and recent observations, it now seems likely the full engine test will last only around 10 seconds, rather than the minute-long duration previously expected. The shorter duration is due to limitations in the Pad 1 water deluge system, which lacks the capacity and design of a traditional flame trench used for extended firings. In contrast, B-16, designated for Flight 10 alongside S-37, has been relatively quiet following its hot staging event and transfer to the Mega Bay. It's currently unclear whether this booster has had its engines installed yet or if any final upgrades have been completed. However, activity is starting to pick up. The booster transport stand has been moved into the Mega Bay, indicating that B-16 may soon be rolled out to the Rocket Garden. This move could either be for final outfitting or to free up space inside the Mega Bay for stacking upcoming boosters. As Flight 10 approaches, more answers about B-16 and S-37 will soon come into focus. For now, attention is turning toward what we can expect from the mission itself. According to recent internal sources, SpaceX has decided not to attempt catching B-16 on this upcoming flight. This decision is both logical and somewhat surprising. On one hand, it makes sense to continue testing landing techniques in the ocean, as was done with B-10 and B-9 before it. On the other hand, B-16 is a brand new booster, and scrapping it after a single use might appear wasteful. However, the reality is that Flight 10 will serve as an important technical milestone, focusing on several complex landing maneuvers. These include the active landing flip immediately after stage separation, a descent at a higher angle of attack, and a landing attempt using only two engines. Each of these objectives presents a high degree of difficulty and increases the risk of mission failure. Removing the variable of a catch attempt simplifies the mission and allows SpaceX to concentrate fully on gathering data from these experimental landing techniques. To support these efforts, several modifications are being made. For the landing flip maneuver, adjustments are likely being made to the hot staging ring to accommodate the aerodynamic and control changes needed. The descent at a steeper angle will test the booster's structural strength and the resilience of critical subsystems. Performing a landing with just two engines will place extra demands on the engine system's reliability and control, especially under conditions of repeated ignition and shutdown. It's very likely that B-16 underwent reinforcement and thorough inspections during its time in the Mega Bay, and this level of attention will continue right up until launch day. These tests, though they may not result in a recovered booster, are laying the groundwork for much more efficient and successful flights in the near future. For example, perfecting the active landing flip and high angle descent will help conserve fuel, extending the range and utility of Starship missions. Mastering two engine landings will give SpaceX the flexibility to complete a landing even in the event of an engine failure. These advances will eventually make catch attempts more viable, reducing risks and increasing reusability. So while B-16 may not be recovered, it will play a vital role in pushing the Starship program forward. Its contribution will help pave 
the way for the next generation of vehicles and recovery systems. Looking even further ahead, the decision not to attempt a catch with B16 also marks a step toward the long-anticipated V3 era. So keep an eye on all the upcoming developments and continue supporting the Starship program. If you're excited for Flight 10, type Ten in the comments. Like the video and subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with every step of SpaceX's bold journey toward making life multiplanetary. Now, let us shift our focus to the next major step in Firefly Aerospace's lunar journey. NASA has just awarded Firefly a significant $176.7 million US dollar contract to build and deliver two advanced lunar rovers, along with three scientific instruments, to the Moon's South Pole. This is a highly anticipated mission under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, commonly known as CLPS, and it represents a notable expansion in scope. Unlike many prior CLPS missions that deliver fewer payloads, this one will feature more rovers and instruments, allowing for deeper and more comprehensive exploration of the moon's most extreme environments. The objective of this mission is to study the presence of usable resources in the moon's polar regions, particularly water ice. These resources will play a crucial role in supporting future lunar missions, especially those involving crewed operations under NASA's Artemis program. By targeting some of the moon's harshest and most scientifically intriguing areas, the mission seeks to provide data that will shape the next generation of exploration. According to a NASA statement, the contract period of performance is scheduled to run from July 29th of 2020 through March 29th of 2030. The actual landing is currently planned for 2029. During that window, Firefly will be responsible for end-to-end -end delivery service, from spacecraft design and payload integration to lunar delivery and operations on the surface. This latest contract represents Firefly's fifth CLPS task order and its fourth scheduled lunar mission. It also highlights the company's rapidly growing influence in the field of lunar exploration. CLPS is designed to enable more frequent and lower cost access to the moon by leveraging commercial space companies. These robotic missions are intended to gather scientific data, test technologies, and scout terrain in support of the Artemis program's broader goal, establishing a long-term human presence on the moon. Joel Kearns, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration at NASA's Science Mission Directorate emphasized this collaborative spirit by stating, Through CLPS, NASA is embracing a new era of lunar exploration with commercial companies leading the way. Firefly has already proven itself capable in this arena. In March of this year, the company successfully completed its first lunar delivery mission, placing 10 NASA payloads on the moon's near side. That achievement laid the groundwork for future efforts. Firefly's next mission, set for 2026, will aim for the moon's far side following the deployment of a lunar orbiter. Then, in in 2028, the company will conduct another mission to investigate the volcanic terrain of the Kuruthusen Domes, a geologically unique region of the moon. The 2029 South Pole mission is especially important because of the scientific and practical value of the landing site. Practical value of the landing site. Permanently shadowed craters in this region are believed to contain significant reserves of frozen water. If confirmed and extracted efficiently, this ice could be used for drinking water, oxygen generation, and even as a component of rocket fuel a game-changer for long-duration missions. In addition to scouting resources, the mission will study potential environmental hazards, such as radiation and surface erosion. These insights will be critical for pre preparing safe habitats and equipment for future astronauts. As Adam Schlesinger, CLPS Program Manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center noted, CLPS deliveries to the Lunar South Pole will provide a better understanding of the exploration environment, steadily progressing toward establishing a long-term human presence on the Moon, as well as eventually human missions to Mars. Overall, this new award is a strong validation of Firefly Aerospace's achievements and its growing role in the next wave of space exploration. The company continues to demonstrate that it can meet NASA's high standards while pushing forward the boundaries of what is possible in commercial spaceflight. So let us watch closely and see what Firefly will accomplish next on its journey to the moon and beyond. Now, let us turn our attention to one of NASA's boldest and most ambitious ideas for the moon the construction of a nuclear reactor. Beyond the goal of returning astronauts to the lunar surface, NASA has long been focused on building sustainable infrastructure that will support long-term human exploration. As those goals begin to move closer to reality, a new and highly ambitious plan has emerged under the leadership of NASA's interim administrator Sean Duffy. According to a recent report from Politico, NASA is preparing to release a directive outlining a roadmap to build a 100-kilowatt nuclear reactor that will one day operate on the surface surface of the moon. This proposed reactor would be a significant upgrade to the 40 kilowatt fission power system that NASA and its partners have been developing for years. The goal is to launch and deploy the system by 2030. To make this vision a reality, 
NASA is expected to begin soliciting proposals from private companies and research organizations across the space and energy industries. This nuclear initiative is part of the Artemis program, NASA's flagship mission to return humans to the moon and eventually establish permanent outposts on the lunar surface. However, providing reliable power for a base on the moon presents unique challenges. Unlike Earth, the moon experiences extremely long nights, with each lunar night lasting the equivalent of about 14 Earth days. During that time, solar power becomes unreliable or even unusable for maintaining life support, communications, and scientific equipment. This is where nuclear power becomes not just an option but a necessity. But this project is about more than just power. It also carries strategic implications. China, in collaboration with Russia, is aggressively pursuing its own lunar program through the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS. Their plan includes landing humans on the moon and building a permanent base of their own. To maintain its leadership in space exploration, NASA must not only match China's pace, but stay one step ahead. Advanced technologies like nuclear reactors could provide the U.S. with a crucial strategic advantage in this new space race. Nuclear energy has numerous benefits in this context. It provides high output, long duration power, and does not rely on the availability of natural lunar resources in the early stages of base development. However, there are also serious challenges. Designing, building, and safely operating a reactor in space is no easy task. It will require require advanced technical expertise, rigorous safety standards, and careful planning for transport, deployment, and long-term maintenance on the moon. Even so, NASA appears confident that the benefits outweigh the risks. This project could be a game-changer for deep space exploration and future missions beyond the moon. Of course, none of this will be possible without first establishing a sustained human presence on the lunar surface. That is where Artemis comes in. Step by step, NASA is laying the foundation for a permanent foothold on the moon. As these critical milestones unfold, in the years ahead, we will be watching closely. Stay tuned. This has been Kevin with Great SpaceX. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you haven't already to stay up to date with yours truly on the latest milestones in SpaceX's journey. Thank you so much for watching, and always remember, curiosity, imagination, and inspiration will follow you so long as you keep looking up.